One legal matter that we recently talked about was the state of Texas passing the heartbeat bill, which defined when a woman is allowed to seek an abortion at approximately six weeks of pregnancy. The Supreme Court's standard in Planned Parenthood of Pennsylvania, Southeastern Pennsylvania versus Casey, the standard is whether the fetus is viable, whether it has a likelihood of succeeding outside the womb. And the problem with this law isn't entirely that Texas wants to try and define when the fetus is viable differently, it's how they did it. Instead of making a law that then gets enforced by the executive branch, which is who is in charge of the police and who's in charge of prosecutors and things, they removed the executive power to enforce the law and they gave the executive power to the people of Texas. So they turned it into a civil action instead of a criminal prosecution and they put a $10,000 bounty on any person who aids or abets an abortion. There was some confusion, including on my part, whether the law actually attacked the woman seeking the abortion, but it seems to be more aimed at the providers. And I'm not sure if the law specifically made it possible to sue the woman. It, it, aiding and abetting an abortion isn't exactly the same thing if you are the woman, you're not really aiding and abetting yourself. So with that said, the law is controversial. It appears to go against federal Supreme Court precedent, and it appears to be really oppressive in the sense that you're giving your neighbors, giving the people of Texas the right to enforce the law and giving them $10,000 if they choose to do so. And then they took away the ability to seek attorney's fees. So if you're the defendant and you win, you don't get your attorney's fees, but someone who prosecutes and wins, they get their attorney's fees. So it's a possibly an unconstitutional shifting of executive branch powers to the people. Whatever it is, the United States has now decided to enforce the various powers of the federal government and the constitution and the laws and the precedent against the state of Texas. So you literally have the United States of America v. Texas. The United States of America, by and through its undersigned counsel, brings this civil action for declaratory and injunctive relief. And we, we're going to do this a little bit backwards. Sometimes your law professors, my law professors, will tell you to look at the end of the thing first. And so what we've got here is a prayer for relief, which comes at the end. The United States is asking for a declaratory judgment stating that SB8, the heartbeat bill, is invalid, null, and void. They are also asking for a preliminary and permanent injunction against the state of Texas, including all of its officers, employees, agents, and this one's different, including the private parties who would bring suit under the law prohibiting the enforcement of SB8. Any other relief, uh, costs, and any other relief. Okay, so I guess the, any other re the first any other relief is to fully effectuate the injunction. So let me go back up to the top and we start with the preliminary statement. It is settled constitutional law that a state may not prohibit any woman from making the ultimate decision to terminate her pregnancy before viability. And that's from Planned Parenthood v. Casey. It limits Roe v. Wade from a trimester system of timing abortion and controls to simply viability. Texas has done just that. It has enacted a statute banning nearly all abortions in the state after six weeks, months before a pregnancy is viable. Texas enacted SB 8 in open defiance of the Constitution. The statute prohibits most pre-viability abortions, even in cases of rape, sexual abuse, or incest. It also prohibits any effort to aid, or indeed any intent to aid, the doctors who provide pre-viability abortions or the women who exercise their right to seek one. Because SB 8 clearly violates the Constitution, Texas adopted an unprecedented scheme to insulate the state from responsibility by making the statute harder to challenge in court. 
Instead of relying on the state's executive branch to enforce the law, as is the norm in Texas and elsewhere, the state has deputized ordinary citizens to serve as bounty hunters who are statutorily authorized to recover $10,000 per claim from individuals who facilitate a woman's exercise of her constitutional rights. And it's important to note that it's a at least $10,000. There could be a higher award. I'm not sure what that would be based on, but there is room in the law for a higher award. And Texas has mandated that its state judicial officers enforce this unconstitutional attack by requiring them to dispense remedies that undeniably burden constitutionally protected rights. It takes little imagination to discern Texas's goal to make it too risky for an abortion clinic to operate in the state, thereby preventing women throughout Texas from exercising their constitutional rights while simultaneously thwarting judicial review. Thus far, the law has had its desired effect. To date, abortion providers have ceased providing services prohibited by SB 8, leaving women in Texas unacceptably and unconstitutionally deprived of abortion services. Yet despite this flagrant deprivation of rights, SB 8 remains in effect. The United States has the authority and responsibility to ensure that Texas cannot evade its obligations under the Constitution and deprive individuals of their constitutional rights by adopting a statutory scheme designed specifically to evade traditional mechanisms of federal judicial review. The federal government therefore brings this suit directly against the state of Texas to obtain a declaration that SB 8 is invalid, to enjoin its enforcement and to protect the rights that Texas has violated. The government also brings this suit to protect other federal interests that SB 8 unconstitutionally impairs. And this is really clever, so pay attention to this part here and when we cover it towards the end. SB 8 conflicts with federal law by purporting to prohibit federal agencies from carrying out their responsibilities under federal law related to abortion services. Because SB 8 does not contain an exception for cases of rape or incest, its terms purport to prohibit the federal government and its employees and agents from performing, funding, reimbursing, or facilitating abortions in such cases. Moreover, SB 8's unconstitutionally broad terms purport to subject federal employees and non-governmental partners who carry out these responsibilities to civil liability and penalties. The United States therefore seeks a declaratory judgment that SB 8 is invalid under the Supremacy Clause and the 14th Amendment is preempted by federal law and violates the doctrine of intergovernmental immunity. So here's the concepts that you get to look forward to here in a moment. The Supremacy Clause, the 14th Amendment, federal preemption, and intergovernmental immunity. You'll really understand the separation of powers, the balance of powers, the supremacy of the federal government over the state governments, and even the sovereignty of the states under the 10th Amendment. We'll probably come into this at some point. Plaintiff is the United States of America. Defendant, the state of Texas, is a state of the United States. Bra bravo for getting that correct. The state of Texas includes all of its officers and agents, and so, etc. And that's going to come into it as well. There's this argument that if the state of Texas is assigning prosecutorial duties, traditionally governmental duties, to the citizens of Texas for this specific thing, that it has made those people state actors. That's going to come into this as well. Federal law, the constitutional right to an abortion. Nearly 50 years ago, the Supreme Court held that the Constitution protects a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy. That's Roe v. Wade. 30 years ago, the court reaffirmed the most central principle of Roe, a woman's right to terminate her pregnancy before viability. And that was Planned Parenthood v. Casey. Casey confirmed Roe's essential holding recognizing the right of a woman to choose to have an abortion before viability and obtain it without undue interference from the state, whose pre-viability interests are not strong enough to support an abortion prohibition or the imposition of substantial obstacles to the woman's right to elect the procedure. State laws that prohibit abortion prior to viability or impose an undue burden on a woman's right to obtain an abortion before viability violate the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment. The Due Process Clause is in the 5th Amendment, and then the 14th Amendment applies the 5th Amendment and others to the states. So the 
14th Amendment incorporates the Bill of Rights and the Due Process Clause and things against the states, is what we say. The sovereign interests of the United States, a true sovereign citizen, whereas here a state seeks to strip individuals of their ability to challenge state action that indisputably violates their federal constitutional rights, the United States has a profound sovereign interest in ensuring that those constitutional rights remain redeemable in federal court. The United States may sue to challenge such constitutional violations that affect the public at large, according to Inri Debs, an 1895 Supreme Court case saying, Every government entrusted by the very terms of its being with powers and duties to be exercised and discharged for the general welfare has a right to apply to its own courts for any proper assistance in the exercise of the one and the discharge of the other, and it is no sufficient answer to appeal to one of those courts that it has no interest or pecuniary interest in the matter. The prerogative of the United States to seek injunctive and declaratory relief to restrain violations of constitutional rights has long been recognized in United States v. City of Jackson, saying, The Constitution cannot mean to give individuals standing to attack state action inconsistent with their constitutional rights, but deny the United States standing when states jeopardize the constitutional rights of the nation. What are they doing here? The government, the U.S. government, is making sure that it's answering the, the defenses that it expects Texas is going to raise. Texas is going to say, the United States is not affected by Texas and this law. Therefore, there's no standing. So the lawsuit here, right in the beginning, right in paragraph 14, is saying, you can't attack us on standing because this is the law of standing. We're going to answer that question before we even get started. The United States, therefore, may sue a state to vindicate the rights of individuals when a state infringes on rights protected by the Constitution. And such an effort is particularly warranted, whereas here private citizens are, by design, substantially burdened in vindicating their own rights. In light of the attempt by Texas to strip its own citizens of the ability to invoke the power of the federal courts to vindicate their rights, the United States not only has a quasi-sovereign interest in the health and well-being of its residents in general, but also a quasi-sovereign interest in not being discriminatorily denied its rightful status within the federal system. The Supremacy Clause the Supremacy Clause of the United States Constitution mandates that this Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof shall be the supreme law of the land. Anything in the Constitution or laws of any state to the contrary notwithstanding. So the United States law and constitution are supreme and cannot be limited by the states. The United States law can limit the states, but a state law cannot limit the United States. So it, the limitations cascade down. A state law is invalid if, among other things, it stands as an obstacle to the accomplishment and execution of the full purpose and objectives of Congress, or if it directly regulates the activities of the federal government. Intergovernmental immunity, this doctrine arises from the supremacy clause of the Constitution and reflects the principle that the states have no power to retard, impede, burden, or in any manner control the operations of the constitutional laws enacted by Congress to carry into effect the powers vested in the national government. The activities of the federal government are free from regulation by any state. State laws cannot control the conduct of individuals acting under and in pursuance of the laws of the United States. A regulation violates the doctrine of intergovernment a regulation violates the doctrine of intergovernmental immunity if it seeks to directly regulate the conduct of agents of the federal government. States may not seek to directly regulate the performance of the federal government by regulating its contractors. A federally owned facility performing a federal function is shielded from direct state regulation, even though the federal function is carried out by a private contractor unless Congress clearly authorizes such regulation. For the purposes of intergovernmental immunity, federal contractors are treated the same as the federal government itself. Yeah, they're state actors. That's the state actor doctrine. When we're one 
wondering if Donald Trump's Twitter account is a state forum or something like a government sponsored forum. It is when he makes it so, but that doesn't then spoil Twitter and make Twitter into a state actor. Twitter would have to be given the powers of a government. Here in this lawsuit, if someone was a federal contractor acting on behalf of the federal government, that makes them a state actor, even if the federal contractor is a private citizen. A state law is unconstitutional that directly interferes with the functions of the federal government by mandating the ways in which a contractor renders services that the federal government hired it to perform. Texas Senate Bill 8. SB 8 bans abortions performed by a physician licensed by the state of Texas if cardiac activity has been detected in the embryo or fetus. Now, maybe that's a loophole in the law, and if a provider was willing to be the test case, they could still say that the embryo does not have a heartbeat, therefore it can perform the procedure. Whether you want to be that and it's the entire state of Texas that's trying to come down on you for that, I don't know if, if we can count on providers to be the soldiers on that battlefield. But if someone wanted to be, there's, there's the loophole that I see so far. SB 8 provides that a physician may not knowingly perform or induce an abortion if the physician detects a fetal heartbeat. The fetal heartbeat is defined in the law as cardiac activity or the steady and repetitive rhythmic contraction of the fetal heart within the gestation sac. So that's that definition is an attempt to make it so vague and broad that any rhythmic contraction, which does start around six weeks, that that means that's a heartbeat. It's not a heartbeat, and actual doctors say so, and I quoted some in the previous episode. An ultrasound can typically detect cardiac motion beginning at approximately six weeks of pregnancy as measured from the first day of the patient's last menstrual period, but an embryo is not viable at six weeks, and many women do not even know they are pregnant at six weeks. A fetus is generally considered viable when there is a reasonable likelihood of the fetus sustaining survival outside the womb with or without artificial support. SB 8 contains no exceptions for pregnancies that result from rape or sexual abuse or incest or for pregnancies involving a fetal defect incompatible with life after birth. The law provides an exception only for an undefined medical emergency that prevents compliance with the law, whatever that is. The prohibitions in SB 8 apply to anyone who performs or induces a prohibited abortion, anyone who knowingly aids or abets the performance or inducement of a prohibited abortion, or even anyone who intends to perform or aid in a prohibited abortion. Under the statute, aiding and abetting includes paying or reimbursing the costs of an abortion through insurance or otherwise. SB 8 limits the defenses available to defendants and subjects them to a fee-shifting regime skewed in favor of claimants. In particular, SB 8 includes an affirmative defense that is available to a limited class of defendants if they can demonstrate that an award of relief would impose an undue burden on a particular woman or group of women seeking an abortion. That limited defense is inconsistent with an unbroken line of Supreme Court cases that prevents states from prohibiting abortion prior to viability without regard to the undue burden test. And even if the undue burden test were the appropriate framework, SB 8's affirmative defense fundamentally distorts the test by, among other things, limiting the scope of evidence on which a defendant may rely and attempting to create new rules of construction and severability solely for state abortion laws and regulations. Additionally, defendants in SB 8 enforcement actions are prohibited from raising other defenses enumerated under SB 8, including that they believe the law was unconstitutional, that they rely on a court decision, later overruled, that was in place at the time of the acts underlying the suit, or that the patient consented to the abortion. SB 8 also states that defendants may not rely on non-mutual issue or claim preclusion or rely as a defense on any other state or federal court decision that is not binding on the court in which the action was brought. 
SB8 deputizes private parties to act as state actors in a public enforcement scheme and uses the judicial system to deprive women of their constitutional rights. In a transparent effort to evade constitutional scrutiny, Texas has outsourced the authority to enforce SB8 to ordinary citizens. SB8 prohibits state and local governmental entities and their employees from enforcing the statute. In their place, SB8 empowers any person to file suit against anyone who performs a prohibited abortion, aids or abets such an abortion, or intends to do those things. A successful claimant can obtain an injunction that prevents a defendant from engaging in these activities and is entitled to at least $10,000, but that's only a minimum, in statutory damages for each abortion the defendant has performed, aided or abetted, as well as costs and attorney's fees. The statute assigns enforcement authority to private individuals through civil litigation in state courts as a means of evading lawsuits challenging SB8's constitutionality. Quoting the Supreme Court's denial and Roberts and Chief Judge Roberts' dissent, the desired consequence appears to be to insulate the state from responsibility for implementing and enforcing the regulatory regime. Indeed, SB 8 was specifically designed to evade ordinary constitutional review. Specifically, the law bars its own enforcement by public agencies, but creates a private cause of action that requires state courts to grant injunctive relief and statutory damages for constitutionally protected activity. This intent has been unmistakably revealed in public statements by the law's architects and champions. For example, the legislative director of Texas Right to Life stated that one of the main motivations for SB8's design is to stymie judicial review. SB8 was crafted out of frustration with courts that block pro-life laws because they think they violate the Constitution or pose undue burdens. Moreover, one of the attorneys principally involved in advising the state on SB8 recently offered a similar observation about laws bearing SB8's private enforcement characteristic. It is practically impossible to bring a pre-enforcement challenge to statutes that establish private rights of action because the litigants who will enforce the statute are hard to identify until they actually bring suit. This is part of the case or controversy requirement, uh, which has standing as part of it. The courts, the special, especially the federal courts, are not supposed to adjudicate things, issues, claims, actions that haven't ripened yet. Um, I'm going to sue my neighbor for hitting me in the face, but they haven't hit me in the face yet. I just want to establish that when they do, I've, I've already won my suit. That does, that's, not a, that's not a ripe cause of action. And that's embodied in the rule that you can't successfully bring a lawsuit or maintain a lawsuit unless the controversy is alive. It's a live case or controversy, meaning that you've actually suffered an injury that is redressable by a decision by a court, that there's a law that it's based on and that the court actually has a remedy that it can grant. And Senator Brian Hughes, one of the principal architects of SB8 in the Texas legislature, removed all doubt about this purpose when he informed reporters that SB8's structure was intended to avoid the fate of other heartbeat bills that have been struck down as unconstitutional. Senator Hughes was quoted succinctly stating the point, we were going to find a way to pass a heartbeat bill that was going to be upheld. Senator Hughes elsewhere deemed the statute a very elegant use of the judicial system. While prior state efforts to unduly burden access to abortion services relied primarily upon executive enforcement of state law, it is doubtless true that a state may act through different agencies, including its legislative, its executive, or its judicial authorities, the three branches of government. And the prohibitions of the amendment extend to all actions of the state denying equal protection of the laws, whether it be action by one of these agencies or another. Awarding the monetary relief that SB8 authorizes to plaintiffs who need not demonstrate any injury or other connection to the underlying abortion procedure constitutes state activity designed to violate the 14th Amendment rights of women in Texas. Under the doctrine of standing in the United States, we have three requirements, injury in fact, 
the plaintiff must have suffered or imminently will suffer an injury. The injury must be concrete and particularized, must be actual or imminent. The injury can be either economic, non-economic, or both. There must be causation, a causal connection between the injury and the conduct complained of, so that the injury is fairly traceable to the challenged action of the defendant and not the result of an independent action of some third party who is not before the court. Redressability, it must be likely that a favorable decision will redress the injury. That the action of state courts and of judicial officers in their official capacities is to be regarded as action of the state within the meaning of the 14th Amendment is a proposition which has long been established by decisions of the Supreme Court. Thus, while Texas has gone to unprecedented lengths to cloak its attack on constitutionally protected rights behind a nominally private cause of action, it nonetheless has compelled its judicial branch to serve an enforcer's role. The judicial branch is a branch of government, so they're state actors. State actrin, as that phrase is understood for the purposes of the 14th Amendment, refers to exertions of state powers in all forms. Under the state action doctrine, private actors also may be found to function as agents or arms of the state itself, and thus are bound by the Constitution. State action may be found if seemingly private behavior may be fairly treated as that of the state itself. The Supreme Court has deemed individuals to be state actors where they exercise powers traditionally exclusively reserved to the state. SB 8 vests individuals with law enforcement authority, a power traditionally reserved exclusively to a sovereign, in a manner that appears to be unprecedented. Among other things, SB 8 does so by providing individuals with unsupervised authority to police violations of the law and by enabling them to obtain civil penalties against anyone in the state without showing any personal injury. These individuals are also state actors to the extent that they are significantly involved in conduct that would be unconstitutional if engaged in by the state itself or Texas has sanctioned their conduct. State action can be found where a law authorized racial discrimination in the housing market, for example. The state's establishment of a primary system made the private party that set up an all-white primary an agency of the state. SB 8 implicates this doctrine by expressly authorizing, indeed empowering, individuals to engage in conduct that violates the constitutional rights of women throughout Texas in a manner in which the state itself would not be able to engage. SB 8 affects interstate commerce. This is another federal power. We have the enumerated powers. You can just type in like federal government enumerated powers, or you can read the Constitution and you'll see that there's an actual list of powers given to the federal government, one of which is to regulate commerce among the several states. We call this the Interstate Commerce Clause, and it's the basis for many federal regulations. Gun control? Well, you probably couldn't regulate guns inside a state except that guns do travel across state lines. So suddenly that's interstate commerce and now you can regulate gun control. Clean air. Clean air crosses state lines. So Clean Air Act. There you go. I'm sure there are other bases for many of these laws. You can have overlapping powers. By stripping women of their constitutional rights to certain abortion services in Texas, as well as outlawing many of the commercial services that provide abortion services and aid women seeking these services, SB 8 forces women who wish to obtain these services to travel out of Texas to other states in order to exercise their constitutional rights, and it hinders businesses and nonprofits engaged in this commercial activity. Indeed, the law has already had this effect, as clinics in Oklahoma, Louisiana, New Mexico, Colorado, and Kansas are being inundated with a surge of pregnant people. One clinic in Oklahoma reported that, after SB 8 went into effect, the number of calls it received from Texans increased from approximately 3 to 5 calls per day to between 50 and 55, so a tenfold increase. The same article makes clear that the proponents of SB 8 are aware of women crossing state lines. Before SB 8 took effect, most Texas women had access to a clinic within 24 miles round trip from their home. Now they will have to travel 496 miles round trip on average to obtain an out-of-state abortion. 
this was one of my points, and it's a little bit of a controversial point, but if you are a wealthy person, wealthy enough to be able to travel to get your abortion, then this law really doesn't affect you. Yeah, it's a little bit more inconvenient. You have to book a flight or you have to drive or something. But if you can afford to take time off of work, if you can afford to take the flight, stay in a hotel, hire an out-of-state doctor who might not be covered by any insurance that you have because that's a state thing, then there's no problem for you. And if you have $10,000 to spend on your abortion, if you lose an SBA challenge, then you can even have one in state. But if you are not wealthy enough, to afford to do those things, then the law applies to you. So it's very much creating a caste system where the law doesn't really affect, maybe it applies to everyone, but it doesn't really affect people who can afford to work around the law. Where the United States is obligated to provide the constitutional abortion services that SB8 outlaws, SB8 purports to require the United States to refrain from providing those services or to relocate women and possibly service providers out of Texas. Similarly, SB8 purports to require the United States to terminate existing monetary contracts and agreements that involve the insurance of or reimbursement of the abortion services SB8 bans. It further prohibits and thus discourages certain interstate commercial transactions involving Texas. For example, SB8 appears to apply to monetary transfers into the state of Texas if those funds may in any manner facilitate an abortion. Thus, SB8 may apply apply to insurance companies throughout the United States that cover abortion services provided in violation of the statute, as well as banks facilitating transfers of funds to reimburse women receiving restricted abortions. And SB8 may also apply to medical device transactions involving out-of-state sellers, including, for example, the sale of medical equipment that could be used to perform abortions outlawed under SB8. SB8 irreparably injures the United States. SB8 attempts to circumvent the pre-viability and undue burden rule by imposing a distorted version of the undue burden test, requiring state courts to weigh the undue burden in every case as part of an affirmative defense in enforcement actions. An affirmative defense comes into it when you're guilty of the thing that they say you are, but you have some exception to the rule. So fair use is an affirmative defense to copyright. But then Lens for Universal also said that fair use is a right unto itself and doesn't require some adjudication for it to be fair use. It is fair use in the first instance, and then you can use it as an affirmative defense if you get sued. But anyone who is going to sue you for copyright infringement is required to evaluate the fair use test before suing or else suffer uh, remedies under the law. SB 8 requires persons who are sued to prove that the imposition of an injunction and monetary penalties against them will impose a substantial obstacle on patients' access to care, and to do so without relying on the effect of an award of relief against other defendants or other potential defendants. So they're saying that if you are sued, you have to prove that this was an undue burden on your access to care, but the undue burden is already there before anybody even gets sued because they're all afraid of getting sued. So it's flipping the cart and the horse and hoping that that can survive judicial review. Even though the practical effect on abortion access across the state is a relevant consideration in evaluating undue burden claims. Accordingly, SB 8's undue burden defense does not remedy the law's unconstitutional abortion ban. SB 8 harms the United States by seeking to foreclose judicial review of a state law that flagrantly infringes the constitutional rights of the public at large and seeks to block the injured members of the public from challenging the law in court. The president has a duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed under the United States Constitution Article 2, Section 3, a duty that is carried out in part by the Attorney General. By prohibiting nearly all abortions in Texas after six weeks, SB 8 unconstitutionally conflicts with the statutory and constitutional responsibilities of the federal government. This is a really interesting argument. The United States is going to say that they have certain duties to their citizens and th that the United States can't provide those services now, and they're going to refer to specific agencies and offices and their duties. SB 8 exposes federal personnel and grantees to liability for carrying out their 
federal obligations to provide access to abortion-related services to persons in the care and custody of federal agencies and interferes with federal contracts and grants with third-party providers who are obligated under their agreements to provide abortion-related services, but refuse to do so to avoid liability under SB 8. So there's organizations that have been given federal funds to provide family planning services, and now they can't provide their services. So that's going to interfere with the U.S. government's grants. SB 8 also increases the costs to federal agencies of carrying out their obligations to the extent that civil penalties and awards to claims are allowable. In addition, it will increase reimbursable costs under federal contracts with third-party providers. Finally, it will increase costs to the extent that agencies must incur increased transportation and other costs to provide individuals in their care with abortion services outside of Texas that are required under federal law but are prohibited by SB 8. Such impacts will likely be felt by numerous federal agencies and their personnel, including the Department of Labor, the Office of Refugee Resettlement, the Bureau of Prisons, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Office of Personnel Management, and the Department of Defense. So you've got all these federal agencies that now won't be able to provide abortion services or otherwise do their contracted jobs in Texas because it's related to providing family planning slash abortion services. And then the complaint is going to go through them. SB 8 will interfere with the operations and increase the costs of the Department of Labor's Jobs Corps program funded by Congress and assists eligible young people ages 16 through 24 with completing their high school education, preparing for meaningful careers and obtaining gainful employment. This is provided through Job Corps centers. They are primarily operated by private contractors some are operated by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. There are four Job Corps centers located in the state of Texas operated by private contractors. SB 8 will interfere with these contractual relationships to the extent that the DOL's contracts require the Texas contractors and their personnel to provide abortion-related services prohibited by SB 8. The Jobs Corps program provides room and board for up to three years, basic health care, living allowance, transportation benefits, and career transition. Contractors must provide medical services through provision or coordination of a wellness program, which includes access to basic medical, dental, and mental health services. The health services include those related to reproductive health and planning which includes access to pregnancy-related services, including information and services related to abortion. Thus, SB 8 interferes with the Department of Labor's contractual relation by prohibiting the provision of such contracted services and impose liability on the contractors and their personnel providing those services. It thereby directs the conduct of such providers and constitutes a direct regulation of the federal government and its contractors. This is one of the strongest arguments in here. They're all very strong arguments, but this is one of the strongest, that these contractors provide these perfectly legitimate services, and since the state has banned them, now the state is regulating the federal government, which it cannot do. The Department of Labor may have to reimburse the contractors for any penalties under SB 8. It may increase transportation costs because any obligation to provide services may include transportation outside of Texas now. The Office of Refugee Resettlement. SB 8 will interfere with the operations and costs of the Office of Refugee Resettlement's transport of unaccompanied children in their care who request abortion-related services constitutionally protected by federal law, but prohibited by SB 8. So when unaccompanied children are in the legal custody of the United States, they have access to basic medical services, including family planning. Courts have already found that minors in custody cannot be obstructed in exercising their constitutional right to access abortion and abortion-related services. The Bureau of Prisons has obligations to provide access to inmates in its care who elect to have an abortion, so some federal inmates in Texas would be covered by that. BOP houses female inmates at three institutions in Texas, Camp Bryan, Carswell and Houston, 
and the medical center at Carswell is the primary medical center for all females in BOP custody across the country, apparently. When a pregnant inmate in custody elects to have an abortion, BOP is required to facilitate that choice. Specifically, BOP regulations require a prison warden to provide each pregnant inmate with medical, religious, and social counseling to aid her in making the decision whether to carry the pregnancy to full term or to have an elective abortion. If the inmate thereafter signs a statement indicating that she elects to have the procedure, the prison's clinical director shall arrange for the abortion to take place. BOP also bears certain costs, and SB8 would increase those costs. So it creates liability, it interferes with, with, with federally guaranteed services. Medicare and Medicaid programs must include abortion services. States may not categorically prohibit the coverage of medically necessary abortion procedure for which federal funds are permitted to be expended, including medically necessary abortions of pregnancies arising from rape or incest. The Office of Personnel Management is responsible for negotiating and approving the health benefits plans made to federal employees and other statutorily eligible persons. Under federal law, health plans under the Federal Employees Health Benefits Program may generally not provide any benefits for coverage or abortions, except where the life of the mother would be endangered if the fetus was carried to term or the pregnancy is the result of a rape or incest. These are the permitted circumstances. SB 8 imposes liability for aiding or abetting the performance of an abortion disallowed under SB 8 or even forming an intent to engage in this kind of conduct. This liability exposure causes federal contractors to breach their agreements with the federal government to avoid such liability. The Department of Defense Federal law permits the provision of abortion procedures at DOD facilities in Texas where the life of the mother would be endangered if the fetus were carried to term or in a case where the pregnancy is the result of an act of rape or incest. The United States has an actual and well-founded fear that the arms of the state that Texas has enlisted will enforce the law directly against it and its agencies, as well as against the public at large, whom the state has endeavored to keep from challenging the statute. There is a self-evident risk that at least one of the many state actors capable of enforcing the law would sue in the case of a violation, and that the state's judicial apparatus would adjudicate that claim. In fact, some individuals and organizations have already threatened to enforce the law, and individuals throughout Texas have already been chilled from exercising their constitutional rights or from providing abortion services based on their reasonable fear of enforcement. So, count one is a Supremacy Clause 14th Amendment violation that the United States Constitution is the law of the land, the supreme law of the land, and state laws that limit those rights are invalid. SB 8 violates the 14th Amendment by depriving a woman of the ability to obtain a pre-viability abortion in most cases. Count two is preemption, which is kind of like the Supremacy Clause, but it says that SB 8 is preempted to the extent it prohibits certain pre-viability abortions that federal agencies are charged with facilitating funding or reimbursing. And it violates the doctrine of intergovernmental immunity that it regulates the activities of the federal government and its contractors. Therefore, it is invalid. And so once again, they ask for a declaratory judgment stating that SB 8 is invalid, null and void, and an injunction, not just against the state, but also its officers, employees, and agents, with those agents including private parties who would bring suit under the law and prohibit any and all enforcement, plus their costs. So that's remarkable, and I think that has a pretty good chance of, of winning. It's pretty well founded. The standing argument is made right from the beginning that this is not just a speculative injury, but that the law has already had a chilling effect and that chilling effect affects the rights of the people of Texas to seek a abortion prior to viability of the fetus. And therefore, since it's already had an effect, it's they've already got standing. And so the United States sounds like the right party to bring this lawsuit. Another way to bring the lawsuit would have been 
for someone to keep providing abortion services within the pre-viability requirement under Casey, but without any regard to SB8, and then to have SB8 enforced against them, like take the chance, someone will eventually enforce it, and then challenge that all the way up to the Supreme Court and get it invalidated there. Uh, that's a really expensive thing to do for a private party or even for like whole women's health. It, even if they've got the money, it's still really expensive to do. So now the United States government is going to do it. And so that's the acting assistant attorney general, Brian Boynton, deputy assistant attorney general, Brian Netter, Michael Baer, counsel to the acting assistant attorney, uh, Alexander Haas, federal programs branch, Jacqueline Sneed Sneed, assistant branch director, Daniel Shvey Shvey, special counsel, and Lisa Newman, federal programs branch, Department of Justice. And a whole, oh, there's a bunch of people from her office. So uh, kudos to all of you for filing that, and I'll be keeping an eye on that and hope that what we all think will happen will happen, that the SB8 law will be found to be unconstitutional and voided. And then maybe we can all move on and it'll never happen again. And Texas will never pass another unconstitutional bill. Uh, like the one that they just did saying that social media platforms can't kick people off. We'll cover that one too. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching. Special thanks to our top supporters in September, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hightoff, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Shadow Tycho, Earthbound Star, Pure Magma, Drew Hart, Tech Tech Potato, and Eric Tams. You can support Lawful Masses on patreon.com slash ljfrench, sponsus.com slash law, through YouTube memberships, or through Floatplane subscriptions. Join me for our weekly live production stream on twitch.tv slash lawful masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everyone has a great week. I love you all. Bye.